Hey guys, Ryan from Spiker Workshop and in this video we're going to be going over the electronics and how to install the lifting mechanism and this will be specifically for the Spiker Cat 2X if you're just buying the blower from me to put on your like a different remote control vehicle this video will still apply to you but you can probably skip ahead towards the middle to the end when I'm going over the uh, snowblower wiring itself this kit is sold on my website you can get it in ready to r install form or kit form where you have to do the soldering yourself so there's all sorts of options and then this is the rest of the snowblower electronics the stuff that I already mounted to the snowblower was included in this like the motor and the servos and you should have a ton of hardware left over this is left over from the cat and this is left over from the blower so we'll be using that to finish up the rest of the mechanical installation so we'll start with the electronics for the lifting mechanism and to quick go over what all these do so the snow cat or the spiker cat is designed to run on 36 volts which neither of these are compatible with so this device steps down 36 volts to 12 volts which then will be running into the speed controller which can handle 12 volts these hobby wing 1060 speed controllers and then from here we'll be speed controlling the actuator which will be lifting and lowering the snowblower and there's a few things that we have to do to the actuator so let's start by opening up this thing we're going to take out these three screws on the back and the three screws that surround this part here so I have the screws removed and I'd recommend putting a paper towel down and grabbing some paper towels because these actuators come with extremely thick grease and when this is outside in the cold it almost turns solid so I had my original prototype actually f seize up on me while I was blowing snow and I couldn't raise or lower the snowblower. That was the main cause of the, the grease got so thick that the motor couldn't even turn the gears anymore. So the first thing we need to do is, is take all these gears out and like pay attention to what order they're in. But I'm going to go ahead and, and clean off as much of the grease as I can. But you should have you know most of the grease removed. You don't have to get all of it. But try and get the stuff in the teeth, you know, at least somewhat. I used a Q-tip on mine. So then the next thing is to remove this piece. And basically what's in here are limit switches. So as the actuator moves up it hits this switch and stops it from moving and then when it moves down it stops it from moving well for the snowblower th this isn't the right like distance we're actually only going to use about half of the throw of the actuator so what we need to do is your kit will come with two external limit switches but we need to take this out completely and um, like back through here these uh, the black and red wires that come down here I'm gonna cut them off here and get them exposed out so we can use them so I cut this part off and I pulled the wires out from underneath those like wire holder pieces and I took the heat shrink tube off so what we're gonna do is take the red wire and connect it to this red wire because before it was acting like a switch you know going through here but we're going to be connecting it directly like this because these wires are going to, to the motor um, unsolder that use some new heat shrink tubing and connect those so I have that wire soldered and now we can put the gears back in here and close everything back up so there's a pin that goes in the main shaft there 
Uh, but first, this medium sized gear is what goes on here first in the middle, like that. And then the tiny gear is flipped upside down in between them. And then there was a little tiny white spacer, which will go on that shaft like that. And then make sure that pin is still in there, and then put the large gear on. And then you have to kind of pack the wire back in here, trying to keep it out of the way of the gears, obviously. And then the top lid has like a slot where the wire fits back in. I will close all this back up. So this white piece has to fit in that groove like that. And then I'll screw all of that back together. Next, we're going to cut off some of the wire because we don't need it anywhere near this long. So cut the wire to about six inches. And then I'm going to carefully expose about an inch of the wire here. Try not to damage the wire while you're taking that off. So I ended up actually taking about three inches of insulation off. I used a tool like this. And then I have the ends ready to apply solder. But first let me talk about what we're doing. So this is the piece that we took out from the inside. You can see they're actually the same exact switch. You can see where the button is on this end. And then on the other side it's flipped around and the button's on that end. So um, there's also on the inside here some diodes. And these diodes we're going to be removing and using on our other switches. So you see that there's a black part and then a, a silver line. Those silver lines are facing each other with the wire connecting them in the middle. And that, that line on the diode is facing away from the button. So I'm going to re recreate all of that on our new switches. So to remove them, I will heat up their solder on the terminals here. And using some kind of um, small flat end, you can raise the one leg up at a time like that. And then go to the other side. They actually joined the the diodes at the, on the middle here. So there we have those removed now. The way that I had it in my vise here was the buttons were facing the outside of the vise. So I'm going to take the new buttons and have them do the same thing have the button face outside try to get them both in here at once so both red buttons are facing outside then I'm gonna come and cut the middle terminal off and then the only difference is we will be adding wire in between so I'm gonna I'm going to cut these down so they're smaller. I'm going to put them in the, the holes in these posts here with some solder. And remember that the silver line on the diode, those will face in towards each other. So face them in. And then I'm also going to get some wire ready. Your kit will come with some new wire just because you don't have to deal with stripping any more of this off. So I'll go ahead and cut, just to be safe, I'll cut another like five or six inches. And you can do black or red, doesn't matter. And then join those in between. And then if you quick jump to the other side before this side hardens, you can kind of go back and forth to get it centered. 
and make sure that the like this wire is not touching the terminal that we cut off down there it shouldn't be but just make sure it's not and then this wire that I got ready I cut it at six inches I'll be putting on that end and then to this end here other piece of wire that we had left over and I, I did end up using the black wire on here so I have more red than black now so I'm gonna run the red wire to doesn't matter which side you run it to so I'll just pick this side here and then this will eventually have a plug soldered onto it and then the actuator We'll take the red wire coming out of the actuator and put that on the other end here. So then the leftover black uh, shorter piece that we have will get soldered to this, the uh, black motor, black wire on the motor, drink tube over that, that the power comes in through here, goes through the switch to the other switch and then to the motor and then ground comes back so now if we take these out this is how they should look close up here so both of the diodes are facing each other while the buttons are facing away from each other a male Dean's plug on the end of these wires with some heat shrink so here's how everything should look I got a plug soldered on there and to test everything just to make sure it works you can use pretty much any battery this isn't a 12 volt so it's it's not going to be at its full speed which is honestly easier just to verify that the switches work so if you hold that in there and then hold one of the switches down at the same time If you hit the other switch, it won't do anything, but the one one of the switches should stop it. And then you can flip the connector around and try the other switch. So you can see this switch is the one that stops it from going out. And then this switch is the one that stops it from going in. So I'm going to just uh, make a mark on one, just so I know when we're installing it, which is which. So this is the one that was stopping it when it was going in. So I'm just going to either put, uh, put a marker or a line or something on it, just something to, to, to know the difference between them. While you're testing this, don't let it run all the way in or all the way out, because it will damage itself. That's what these are for. So just use it within a, an inch or so while you're trying it out until we get everything installed. So next we'll get the connectors ready for the speed controller and the step down converter. So on the speed controller I'm going to cut all these wires off or all these plugs off because we're not using any of those. And the red and black is what will be going to the power or the battery and then the the blue and yellow are what will be going out to our actuator. So for the blue and yellow, I'll be putting on a female Dean's connector. I also forgot to mention that on my website, you guys will have the option of either Dean's or XT60 plugs. I'll be offering either or. And then on the uh, battery side we'll be putting another male connector because you always want stuff that doesn't have power coming out of it to be whatever has exposed terminals so you can't short live power like the the speed controller end could potentially have live voltage coming out if the motor is telling it or you know if this, the motor's trying to spin so we need to have something that can't short since this motor will won't be putting out a voltage by itself normally we put one on there that can be shorted because it doesn't matter. The same will apply when we when we do that one. 
um, which I'll just show you now here. So on the, the bottom of it, it shows the what wires are which. So for the 36 volt side, which is the input, this side will have a male connector. And then the output, which is 12 volts, will have a female connector. So I'm going to go ahead and put all those on. And here I have all the plugs assembled. So make sure that when you're actually installing these parts in the machine that you understand what voltages are coming from where so you don't plug in something in the wrong spot. Like, like don't connect this up to the 36 volt power. This thing will probably explode on you. And um, that's really the only thing not to do. Same with this, don't plug this into 36 volts will also probably explode. Just, you know, it's even if you bought the kit ready to wire from me, I will have like labels and stuff on everything, but it's, it's worth watching this video through just so you know what is all in the machine. So, um, I'll show you how it's connected here, but I'm gonna take it back apart because it's easier to install in the machine. But, so we have 36 volts coming in, 12 volts coming out, which will be connecting to the speed controller. And then we have the speed controller power going out to our actuator. And that's really all there is to it. So one other thing to mention is this speed controller has a battery elimination circuit, or BEC, inside of it. And it can handle up to 3 amps at 5 volts, which is a really decent you know, power supply. So this will be supplying power to like the snowblower uh, servos, like the rotation and the chute spout. Also, the, uh, there'll probably be a couple other things, like or the 5-volt uh, light system for the, the uh, hull. But if you're using like a different BEC or another speed controller, you'll want to remove this red wire because y you can't have multiple multiple power sources feeding into the, to a receiver like you have to choose one whichever has the most current output and then also on this board there are jumper selectors so I would take them all or take them both out and then you either have a lipo mode or a like standard battery mode Depends on what batteries you're going to be running, but I'm going to put it in the standard mode for the seal lead acids that I'll be running. And then the top jumper, when you remove it, it makes it so there's no brake function. So it goes from forward to reverse instantly without, you know, having to double tap it or anything. Which is perfect for this actuator, so we don't need a brake for the actuator. So that uh, finishes the actual wiring for the lifting mechanic. So I'm going to jump ahead to the snowblower electronics. In the snowblower assembly video, we covered how to install the motor and the servos. In this, I'm going to show you how to wire up the speed controller, as well as the mini speed controller for the 360 degree rotation chute. So the 360 degree rotation servo for the snowblower I'll show you what I do to them. It's a very similar process to any servo, but I opened it up here, and the first thing that you need to do is there's a there was a pin here that I removed, and that pin was preventing it from spinning a full circle on these stops in the case. Most servos will just have a pin that you can pull out, but I have seen some where it, it's like actually on the gear so you need to like dremel it off or something but any servo should be able to be converted to 360 and then it's up to you if you want to do this or not but if you buy my electronics kit it comes with a, a small speed controller and you can use that speed controller to to control the motor instead of using the circuitry that's in servos so I actually took the whole electronics out of here, including the potentiometer, which was down at the bottom here. 
which you have to remove these to make a 360 also. And then what I did is I just directly wired the servo leads into the motor and then we'll be going from the speed controller to this later. The signal wire is not connected to anything. I just kind of put it down in the case there. But doing that will convert it into a speed controlled 360 degree servo. One other thing is I meant that if you don't want to remove this circuitry from your servo, you can still make it work like a 360 degree one. That's how my servos were sold for the mini snowblower. And the only difference is instead of cutting everything out, you still have to remove the potentiometer, but you you um, need to like keep it in the case along with the circuitry, but don't put it back in the gear because these can't spin 360 degrees. And then you need to power the servo on your radio and then center your stick and the servo will be moving and you use the potentiometer to center the servo so the ser servo stops moving so then everything is centered and then you use some kind of glue on the potentiometer to keep it from spinning on its own that way when it's inside of here and you close it all back up the servo will still function without a speed controller just like from the servo electronics itself the only difference is it will wander on you so if your trim isn't or if your radio doesn't go perfectly to zero every time you'll get the because there's no dead zone is the difference so the servo will slowly creep on you which it's up to you if you want to deal with that or not but if you do this method where you take it all the way out and run an external speed controller then the external speed controller has a dead zone so it, it will never wander on you. It's just a more reliable control method. So to get the mini speed controller adapted to to do what we need it to do, well, we need to do a bunch of modifications to it. So by default, the thing can accept an input voltage of between 5 and 8 volts or so. So what we can do is, since we're trying to control the servo, the 360 degree servo for the chute, which runs on 5 volts, we don't need to run any external battery to this thing. We can rearrange the wiring so that it's taking the 5 volt power from your receiver port directly. So when we're done with it, it will only have receiver power in and then motor wire out. So to, to start doing that, there's a like a heat shrink around here. I'm going to cut that off. Just to make it easier, I'm actually going to remove all of the wires from the board. I'm going to unsolder everything. So I removed everything except the capacitor. That can stay on there. So what we need to do is your kit will come with one of these really long um, servo extension wires. So I'm going to cut off this plug, the male plug. I'm going to cut that off and remove the yellow wire completely from this. So I have that cut and then I have the other end ready to solder. And the, the yellow wire I just kind of clipped right there. It should be fine just like that. No power will ever be applied to that. And then I'm going to put these terminals where the the motor wires were, which are the two center terminals. It really doesn't matter which direction that these go, because we can always reverse that from the radio. So there, that's connected. And this is where the 360 degree servo will connect. This is the output to that. And then next, using the the servo lead that we took off of this board from here, this will be used to take power from the receiver to communicate with this to speed, you know, control the speed. And then we're also going to use this to be powering the servo at the same time. So the way that we do that is we'll take the red wire and cut the red wire off about here because we need the red wire to run from that terminal and also over here to this positive terminal. So if you cut it 
approximately at, at that distance. And then I'm going to trim off some of the insulation and connect both of the wires to that terminal and then to that terminal. And then also connect the ground and signal back up. So to connect those, you can see I cut it and then put some solder in the end. I'll just lay the red wire over this terminal and then hold the other one up to it also so I can get all of it soldered at the same time. And then hopefully with some luck that turns out for you there. And then I will connect those back up to there. It's actually labeled so it's negative, positive, and signal. So it should look like some, something like this now. And this was the, the old battery input, you know, these wires that were on here. So now we've, we've changed it over so it will be taking 5 volts directly from the receiver and then using that same 5 volts to output to our servo. And we don't need to connect this terminal because they already share ground, so you can leave that as is. And then the last thing we have to do is, there was a power switch, which we don't need because the whole system will be running through a giant power switch. So we need to bridge those two terminals so it's always on. It works good if you actually just lay that wire across and then solder it to both sides. And then I'll just go ahead and clip it off. And then your kit will also come with a big piece of heat shrink tube to put back over the whole thing. And then you have a bunch of extra stuff left over. Power plugs and a little micro switch. So just to make sure it works before I put the heat shrink on, we should get the light on, hopefully. And then this end will go to our 360 degree servo which we modified to act just like a motor instead of a servo. So what the benefit of doing all this extra work is that the, ser the uh, speed controller has a dead zone so the chute will never wander on you. You, you know, it, it will stay where you put it unlike the other modification to make a servo 360. So now that we have the mini speed controller ready to go, we can put that aside. And then the the next bit of wiring is to get the speed controller wired up. And you'll, and you'll have some uh, plugs and wire to do that. And then also there are a, a couple more extension wires left. These two long ones are going to be like actually used as extension cords to run the ro the uh, rotation and the spout wires from the the uh, center of the box out to the front. We'll, we'll get to that towards the end. But then there's one of these left which has two male plugs and we need to cut this because we're only going to use one half of it. But these controllers don't come with wires like this yet, so we're gonna make one out of that. So I'm just gonna cut off the plug, maybe like an inch or so in, and this we won't use. And then this plug, I'm going to be removing the red wire. So if you strip them all down like this here, I use a dull knife. Don't use a sharp one so you have less chance of actually cutting yourself. If you use a dull one, you don't have to worry quite so much. But there's like a tab that you lift up, and then you should be able to pull that wire through like that. So then our speed controller comes with a couple accessories with it. We don't use these terminals, they, they will not supply enough current for us, and you probably won't need the jumper. and. There, these are some extra pins in case you messed up on the uh, 360 degree shoot 
which was covered in the snowblower video. Here is the pinout for this board. So you can see that the uh, RC stuff is right here. They're running this way. So it would be like this here. And we're going to be soldering the wires directly into the board just to save space. So we'll be connecting the ground to ground and then the signal to one here, which you can see are, are these, these ones here, ground and then RC1. And then on this side is where we'll be wiring in. This is very similar to how we did the Spiker Cat electronics if you were following that along. But we need power in and then ground back out. And then the two center ones are for the motor. So I'm going to cut this long wire, the big long power wire that comes with the kit. I'm going to cut this at about four inches. So here I have everything soldered on. I got the ground for the servo signal and then the signal going in there. You can see that there. And then I have the power wires soldered up. I decided to put the XT60 plug just for the snowblower motor just because it'll be outside the vehicle. These, these look a little bit more rugged. Um, but like I said, you can Honestly, these electronics kits might just come with both plugs, like the same amount of each, so you can pick. Because, you know, there's a thousand different ways you could wire this. You know, so it's this this video is just kind of like a guide to show you, you know, the basics of it. But you can you can go nuts and do whatever you want with it for sure. Um, but make sure to double check the pinouts when you're all done. So you can see this is the battery coming in so I have positive on the outside which is V in which is right and then ground which is right and then the two two middle wires are going out to the the motor plug and these don't have to be a certain direction you can you can uh, flip it from the radio if it's the wrong rotation and then one last thing to do is quick program the board so this is a program that you get from the Polo Lu website. This, these are the guys who make these boards. And I'm actually in talks with them to try and get them to make a custom version specifically for the snowblower or a custom firmware. Um, I'm hoping they come through with that. If they do, I'll make another video showing you how to get that to work. But for now, it still works just fine. So there's a, a USB port on it. I'll go ahead and plug it into the computer and you should get some some lights and stuff that come on and then this program yeah there it goes once it installs the, it automatically installed the drivers for me and now it's connected to the motor controller and you can see that they have all sorts of settings in here they have a current limiting function which is sweet Oops, sorry. So I'm trying to get them to make it so if the current limit is tripped that the blower actually shuts down completely until you go and manually reset the system. The way it currently works now is it will just keep the motor below or at the current limit that you set, which is just fine for like robots, like, you know, wheels and driving systems. But hopefully they can come through and make that work um, that way, if you get a, a tree branch or something stuck in there, the system will detect the spike and then shut it all down until you go and clear it. But, you know, that's not how it works at the moment, but hopefully they can do that. And then I have a profile set up. So if you go to File, Open Settings File, and then inside the STL file or on my website under the download links you can get my motor controller settings and the one for the snowblower is the 24 v19 so I'll double click on that and then at the bottom there's a apply settings button and now everything is set up for the snowblower like the RC and um, default starting current and stuff 
So we can exit and unplug it. The Spiker Cat kit will come with one more of these electronics trays and the one that had four bolt holes is meant for this. So using these screws I'm going to put this on here just like that and there it is mounted. So to get ready to put, install the actuator we're going to need these parts here and these screws are all in your Spiker Cat hardware kit. You had a ton of stuff left over and we need these plastic parts and they have some support material that we need to clean up and it's a little tricky because you can crack the layer lines if you go too crazy I included a third one just in case that happens but I'm going to uh, probably put it on the table like this and use the table as a backstop to slice through that because it should be like a slot so I have that removed and then I also used a file just to um, smooth it out in there. And then next we'll use the small screws here to attach the limit switches from our actuator to these. And if you were following along earlier, I marked the one that stopped the actuator from going in. So when this switch is hit and the actuator is moving this way, it will stop moving. So this switch needs to actually be on the front, so it will be installed onto one of these, just like this. So the lever is facing down, so yeah, the lever needs to be down, and this part facing you, like this here. So here I have both limit switches screwed to those posts, so it should look like this. Both levers facing down and both of those slides facing towards us like that. There are these two other printed parts and there's a right and left. You can see one side has like a 45 degree angle here. So when you're looking at them like this, this is the side we'll be installing the limit switches on. So we'll put this other piece aside and then using the other screws that I showed earlier these things will be getting mounted like this. Um, maybe put the uh, the wires on the front side like that. So this is designed so that you can slide the limit switches from the top and adjust the like the throw of how far the snowblower gets lifted up and down. Limit switches mounted and ready. Next is to get the swing arm ready. This is what we'll pivot in here to actually hit the switches. Um, this I didn't have a sticker for, but it's an M3 by 80 millimeters. It's about 3 inches and an eighth of an inch long. And I'm going to put the Traxxas connectors on there. And then one of the Traxxas connectors will connect to the top of this post with this screw. And then from the back side here, on this side, the longer screw and the washer will go on. And here is everything together. Um, the linkage actually went on the back flat side, not, not on top of there. So it should look like this. And then you see that screw on the back. I left loose. Um, probably could be a little bit looser actually. So the way that it works is as the actuator moves the blower up and down, this will be connected to the same point, so it will stop when it goes all the way down and when it comes up. And then from the top of the machine you can adjust very easily like the range of how much travel it has. So to join all these pieces together we'll need these bolts here. We'll take and feed a washer on here, and then it will start feeding in through this side here. And then these parts have a right and a left. So this is the one that it will feed into. This base kind of comes towards this part like this. And then it will go into the actuator. And then on the other side, it will be like this. And then the mirrored side of this goes over here with another washer and lock nut on the end. 
So to get the actuator in the hull, these are what we'll need to connect it. I also recommend working on this at the edge of a table because in order to put these flatheads, we put them up under these four holes here and you can roll the machine off the edge of the table to get the screwdriver under there. So the way to get the entire assembly in here is everything kind of has to line up here. So you need the control rod arm and I'll try and get the, the light wires out of the way but that control rod arm goes through a little opening right here and the actuator goes through the big opening there or actually we can't put it in yet um, we have to take these bolts out these the larger bolts here will be replacing the shorter ones here so remove these bolts really quick so with these bolts removed now we can actually put this in here so you kind of make sure that the rods coming out the hole there and this actuator and then put these above temporarily so the back side can get um, dropped in place you, it's kind of a tight fit you gotta just uh, work it in its spot there and try not to put it on top of any wires because there's a lot of wires in here and then we can back it up until oops the rod came out so then you back it back out until all this stuff aligns here. So the screws we took out, we're going to replace with the longer ones. And they'll go all the way through the holes on those arms there. And then coming up through the bottom of the machine, we'll be using those flat heads. Those will come up through the four holes on those mount points. So here I have everything screwed in. I have the four bolts coming up underneath. And that's one benefit of the aluminum hull upgrade. It makes the blower lifting mechanism like significantly more rigid. The when this is connecting just to the plastic hull, which is how my blue and orange one was, the blower can like just move a little bit more freely on its own. But this makes it a lot more stable. Um, and these bolts you can you can tighten down pretty tight. It, it like pinches the whole front end together to make it stronger and then make sure that there's no wires in the way of the limit switches down over here it should be able to freely move like this you can hear it hitting them so this next part we're going to be putting on a gasket using this hardware and the material you use for the gasket you will have to provide um, it, you can be pretty much anything I would recommend just some kind of really thick plastic like from product packaging or um, you could even use like a, a thin piece of rubber um, or possibly the kit that you got from me in the mail probably is using this as packing material because I frequently use the um, spool packaging from plastic like the plastic that I print this stuff in I'll use that as packing material so cut a square so here I applied it I just cut a very small slit in the plastic and then I forced it over this which made it open and kind of conform to it and you can see the the main purpose of this is just to block snow out you know it's not to make the thing waterproof it's just to make it not let snow in there, you know, as you're going off-roading or um, just the, the overspray from snow blowers. And then I'll use a knife and just trim up around the edge. And you can play around with different materials to use for this, but you could use really anything, like a Ziploc bag, a garbage bag, you know, anything will work for that. Then you can see once you clean it up, it actually doesn't look too bad, and it will keep snow out for sure. Next, I'm going to put the control arms back on. We removed them during the assembly just to make it easier, but this was the hardware that it was using. And the side that has a pocket, that faces outwards. So they'll go on like this. 
and then that screw and washer come in right here and since it's a tight fit if you have one of these short screwdrivers is it you know makes it easier to install those so next we'll use that screw and connect the linkage together so this part you want it facing like this so that the two holes drilled through are facing down and then this screw will be running in sideways there's a hole right there that one so I'm gonna screw that in you can get a screwdriver in here if you have it kind of angled like this so next to connect that we'll use a two inch long quarter 20 I forgot to print the sticker for that one and a lock nut this doesn't use any washers and it'll go in through the side like that and when you're screwing this in you only need to do this like not even a quarter of a turn this you don't have to fully tighten down even hand tightening it's fine that lock nut only needs to grab it a little bit it's not going to fall out of there and then the next thing is using this hardware and the big bar piece here so those four holes will line up with those up on top here like this and the longer screws will go in the thicker part right here and the shorter screws will go in the shorter side and it'd be nice to roll it off the table again so it's hanging over the edge of the table and then you can eat more easily put those screws in so this is how it should look from the underneath view so then the last screw for the whole lifting assembly are these ones here I'm showing these for now just because this is the screw that you'll use when you actually connect the snowblower to the bracket but we're not going to use that now but I'll just show it now so I don't have to later because it goes in the same spot almost so the shorter one with the washer will come in through the bottom where that that uh, pocket is there and if you can't get at it you'll have to temporarily plug in the actuator to a battery or you know use some jumper wires to wire to some something to get it to move out so once you have those two screws in on the ends here the next step is to fine-tune the limit switches on the actuator and you can do that with any power source before we get everything else wired up so I'll plug it in and you can see it's this direction is moving up so I'm gonna go ahead and put the limit switches all the way in but that way they'll trigger early so then we can fine-tune it from there so that one you could hear stopped it if it didn't stop it you probably have your um, limit switches backwards which go back in the video to that section and um, but if, if it is working then we can slowly inch the switch up so see it stopped when there's just a little gap I'm gonna go just a little bit more a little bit back and then tighten that down and don't go too tight just tight enough to make the switch not slide now if we test it again here I'll open it a little and then close it yeah, I think I could go just a little bit farther and you might have to play around with this after the snowblower is hanging on it because the snowblower will make it you know pull a little bit more but this will get it close so then for the downward limit just make sure it works and I would leave that until you have the snowblower on I would put it at the maximum for now or, you know like the um, the closest so it doesn't go down very far and then we'll fine-tune that after we get the snowblower mounted to the machine because there's, there's not a good way to tell how far it is unless the snowblower is on it so the only thing left to do now is finish up the wiring and tie all these systems together so next up we're gonna start installing the electronics in the cat here or oh wait no this this cat so you can see I 
removed the electronics box that we were using in the assembly video for this chassis, I thought it would be easier to just um, rip it all out and show you from the start because there's a lot of components we'll be adding. You know, all the stuff that we did at the beginning of this video. And I'm still waiting on these boards in the mail. It's a power distribution board that is meant to split up the power, like, easily. Since I still don't have those, I just made up myself some um, Y splitters, so it's parallel. And I'll be putting those just on these for now. This is where our power was coming in, because we had battery power coming in through the front switch, and then back through here to distribute the power to the two speed controllers. But we're adding two more items, so two Y splitters give us, you know, a total of four now. And one thing is, in that video, I added a jumper, so this speed controller was supplying 5 volts to our receiver but we're, I'm gonna remove that and you could go as far as unsoldering it if you wanted but I'm just gonna remove it so now it's not supplying 5 volts because we'll be using the 5 volt supply from this instead we might as well start with the components that will be going inside the box so this is all stuff that we've done in the assembly video for the chassis. We need some more space in here though, so I'm going to move this back one slot. And then our new one that we made for the snow blower, slightly more powerful current limit. This one can handle, they say 19 amps without a heatsink, but since we're running the snowblower at 100% throttle all the time, they said that you can increase the amperage just because there's no switching losses from having it PWM'd. So it's, it's, it's better to run your snowblower at 100% all the time. Well, d depending on what motor you're running, I guess. But I'm going to drop this in here and try and keep the wires out of the way. And then I have the servo lead from it. Or this this plug was our lights. We we were using that to power our lights, so I'm gonna move that actually to this first slot because that is uh, unused. And then the motor controller for the snowblower. First, I need to route it underneath this. And this one will be plugging into channel three, the uh, speed controller for the actuator, and it has a switch. Uh, make sure it's already turned on, and I'm just going to clip it on the side here. They have like a nice little holder for it. So again, make sure that if you're using other electronics, that only one source of power is being supplied to the receiver. If you have two different sources, they kind of fight over each other, and it could cause, you know, a number of issues. So the channels are very similar to the Mini Cat. The only difference being that Shoot Servo is actually the 360 degree rotation, and Plow Servo will be the spout angle of the chute. And then there will also be a seventh channel if you are running the Salt Spreader. I ran that to the seventh channel on my radio, which is an optional upgrade. You can tow those ride-on uh, lawnmower accessories behind this thing, which is pretty sweet. Lifting servo is actually our lifting actuator, which will be running on the speed controller. So that was channel four. And then channel five and six, the mini speed controller that we worked on earlier, this one will be going on channel number five and then channel number six extension wires and then 
this mini speed controller you can fit right in between the wall kind of like that so I believe that is the only thing that we needed to change inside this control box so also just kind of keep these wires coming out in these approximate spots so after we close the lid you'll know like you know the the really long wires for the snowblower and then all these male plugs need 36 volts of input going to each speed controller and then these two are the motor outputs for the the actual motors of the cat and then the speed controller can't fit in here but these specific speed controllers are waterproof so that's perfectly fine for it to be outside the protected box so I'm gonna close that back up so this is what your interior should look approximately like um, all these wires here if you missed that in the other video these are just for the lights on the lower chassis it's a lot more complicated than it looks or I mean it's not as complicated as it looks there's it's literally just one one plug for all that which is the lights and then we have the two plugs for the motors and the plug for the actuator and the way I have been doing it is I have been putting the uh, converter down at the bottom here control box right on top of it but I'm gonna start plugging some stuff in before I do that this is just kinda have to bear with me here because there's a lot of things so these three wires are all going out to the snowblower we got the snowblower motor the spout rotation and then the 360 degree rotation so I'm gonna route those probably just right through here and then I'll deal with those in a minute so our motor plugs are the ones on the ends here so I will plug those in right now And then we have three plugs here waiting for 36 volt power. And like, whoops, sorry. Like I was talking about earlier, I made just some Y harnesses for now. And this is the power coming from the battery pack. So I'll plug all these in to here. And then we have the lights, which will be plugged into that little plug that was coming out of the receiver, because those are 5 volts. And then we have one, one more 36 volt plug, which will be running to the step-down converter. And then the step-down converter comes back out to 12 volts for our uh, speed controller which is for the actuator so I'll kind of pull that wire in here to plug in and that is all of the connections and it's up to you guys to make it look nice and neat now on the inside like I was saying before if you get my um, power distribution board this whole clump of mess right here will be just on a board and I still don't know physically where it will be located I was thinking of probably vertically right here or you know wherever you guys can find space so here's what I came up with most of the power wires are like held up down here and there's plenty of room to still let the wires come around the corner of the battery down there just make sure that they don't unplug when you're putting in the battery and then on this side I put the speed controller for the actuator and the only things I haven't hooked up yet are the power switch and the voltmeter you know which is on the, the lid which we'll put on in a minute so before we actually plug in anything to test it there is sadly one more thing that we have to do so here I have both radios for my 
um, well, I need to readjust the backlights because it's kind of backwards. The, the blue radio is for the green snowcat here, and the white one is for the, the blue and orange snowcat that have been in all my videos. So the actuator system, since we're using a speed controller instead of a servo, this has no like position data, so it has no idea where it's at besides the limit switches. So that makes it so that we need to have a, a slightly different control layout. So this is for the mini spiker cat, where wherever you move this is where the snowblower angle will will like stay. But that can't really be used with a speed controller because, you know, the speed controller stops moving when it's centered and then it starts going backwards or forwards. So if you leave this down all the time, you know, it will just go all the way to the ground and tell those limit switches, tell it to stop. But you need to be able to, like, trim the height and doing this is too... I mean, you could do this if you wanted, but you don't really have any sense of when it's stopped moving. So the solution which leave some comments down below if you guys think of a better control scheme but this is what I came up with so I am gonna offer on my website a spring kit for these radios or if you buy a new radio from me I'll have the option of if you want it spring loaded or not spring loaded but it's actually um, both of these sticks are spring loaded right now so this one's for driving like normal and then the spring load on this is what's controlling the actuator speed controller. So like when you want to adjust it, like say you want to trim the snowblower down just a little bit, well you kind of just tap it and then the snowblower will move just a little bit. Or you know you can hold it all the way down until the snowblower um, hits one of these limit switches and then stops moving. The only downside is every time you drop the snowblower back down, you have to manually set it back to the same spot. They do actually sell servo controlled actuators, like the exact same one you're looking at here, servo powered, but they're like $300 just for the actuator. So there is an option if someone wants to spend that. Um, Servocity.com is the one who sells that. Um, I don't know if I'll ever put that in because this this is working fine for me but it's just something to you know that you're gonna have to deal with on this machine so I'll show you really quickly how to open the radio up and put in the spring kit to make it spring loaded and then another downside of that is then you'll probably lose the functionality on the mini cat if you happen to own both machines so you'd either have to buy another radio or change how you drive, you know, either one. So it's kind of a uh, tricky thing. Like I was saying, if anyone has any suggestions for different, different layouts, let me know. I did try it once where using left and right was to control the actuator. So you would like, you would like switch. I don't remember what switch I had it, but it was like, if you switched up, then it was controlling the shoot rotation. And then if you switch down, it was controlling the actuator, which did work, but it was like really confusing and slow to drive. So I, I ended up switching it to this. So to change the spring over is actually not that difficult. The kit on my website will come with a 3D printed arm and two springs. I'm only gonna use one though on this video, but I'm gonna include two in case you either lose one or if you want to swap both sides to the same exact spring because these might not feel the exact same on the joystick it'll be very close though but depending on if you're that you know if you can notice the difference so after you take the screws off you can leave the wires connected just kind of spin it off to the side here like this so you can see this this side is spring loaded right now so all it is is that spring is right here and then that arm uh, makes makes it spring back to center, basically. And then on the other side, that is not spring return. It still physically has all the components here to be spring return, except there's no spring or arm. Instead, there's this bar here. So you want to remove this bar. 
it's just two screws. And then I would save this bar in case you want to switch back someday. Like save that in a, you know, safe spot. This screw here, we're going to back way off. And then you can see down at the bottom, there is a little tiny arm. So see how I can hook that and move it up? We're going to try and do that with the spring to catch it. And then this arm will go in. Over here there's a pin. So you want to slide that over the pin. You kind of have to tip the arm way back to get it in there. And then we need to connect the spring between that lever on the bottom and the lever on the top. And it's slightly difficult because you can lose the spring. If you put too much tension on it, it can go flying on you. So the way that I do it is I will use a needle nose and then I'll lower it down in there and hook that part on the bottom. Hold the pliers so the bottom loop is, you know, even with that. And then when it starts to get hooked, use this lever to push the spring on that piece. See how it snapped on there now? I think these springs are just slightly smaller than the stock ones, so it needs a little bit of extra help to get on there. And then I'll lower the arm while I'm still holding the spring with the pliers. And then this is the second tricky part, is trying to get this to grab onto that arm. Let's see if I can use this stick to help again. You can see it's halfway on. There we go, I actually got it. So with great effort and patience, you can get these on, but even the stock ones are really difficult. So then you can tension it by putting that screw back in. And then the, the lower you screw the screw down, the harder the spring feels on the joystick. You can see that arm moves down to pull the spring. Now they both have spring return. While you're closing it up, just make sure like nothing fell in here. And also make sure as you're closing it that these two spring terminals don't get caught in between the antenna wire. One more thing to do is now that we have our nice spring return on our radio, the next problem is if you already own one of these radios from me, you will not have the correct profile on it and these radios have no way to update them like I send them off with you know just what is on it but there's software that you can put on your computer to help you in setting up the profile and this software I'll include in the STL files also I'll just put it on my downloads section on my website and it's this program called EEPE. -E. Honestly, don't know what that stands for, but it is specifically for like custom radio control firmwares. So I installed that already, so I'm going to open it. And this is the program here. Um, I would recommend not updating just because I'm not sure if something you know might not work. But then you go up to here to the open button and then here I have the Spiker Profiles, version 1, and when you open that you'll see I have the three models here, Blizzard, Spiker Cat, and the new, well it's the Spiker Cat 2X, but I couldn't fit that in the display so I just called it the Monster Cat. And um, if you double click on that, then you get this window, and on your radio when you hold the arrow over, and like go into a profile to edit it. Well actually I could, um, I, I'll copy this so it's duplicating it and then I'll edit, um, you know, I'll, I'll edit the top one. So mixer and model setup. So when I go into mixer on the program you can go to mixes and it's the exact same stuff that's on the radio 
So you can use this software to look through all these tabs here and really the only differences are going to be under mixes, limits, and switches. None of the other stuff you got to worry about. It's just those three mixes, limits, and switches. Also under setup, this is where you like type in the name that it will show among you know other stuff but everything in this software is on your radio so to create the profile you would just go into the mixes and copy over all the settings that you see and you know delete any settings that you don't see on the radio on here so you can see like mine is not the same as what's on there channel 3 says channel 16 which is wrong, it should say, um, you know, what, what it says there, plus 100% P3. And then you can go and click, double click on these for more information. So the same as when you go in to channel 3 and edit, all this information is what you're seeing here. So source, weight, offset, and then as you scroll down, you know it's all the same stuff so it's pretty easy to use this program to copy the settings over if you buy the radio from me more recently like well from after the date of this video your radio will come with all three of these profiles so you don't have to worry about this um, but yeah this, this program is really easy to to work with so I'll go ahead and copy all the stuff over. So once you have everything with your radio straightened out, we can turn it on and hopefully everything works right. So I'll go ahead and plug, plug back in the power switch. Make sure it's off though before you plug it in. Radio is on. So we have movement again, or except the movement is wrong. I think I need to switch the motor plugs. Okay, there we go. Now I have it working like normal. And then hopefully our um, actuator is working. So the way that the radio is set up is when this switch is up, it will automatically raise the blower up and turn the blower off. And this is your blower on and off and your bl blower throttle is over here. So if the actuator is not doing anything, because this is the actuator, you gotta flick this down and then, yep, yeah, it looks like it's working. And the switches should stop it once it gets to the ends, which it is. And what's sweet is with the speed controller, you have like really fine control so when you're out blowing, you can like, you can give it like a tap, and you can see that it, it moves just the smallest amount, which is nice for like fine adjustments. And then you can see like when you have it down, if you just flick this up, then it will automatically come back up by itself. But like I was saying earlier, to go back down, every time you have to manually first flick that switch back down and then this to get it back to where you were you'll get used to it I, I got I got used to it pretty fast on the blue one and then also keep in mind that if if it's up and the snowblower is on the snowblower will be turned off but when you lower this again the snowblower will turn right back on so you, you gotta keep in mind that in or, you know this is the snowblower and then this you know kind of influences the snowblower but in order to, to turn the snowblower off just turn that off and then it's off and you could also set this dial back to zero to cut it off like two different ways so now that that's all working good I'm gonna get the snowblower up here and show you how to hook that up so let's just connect one thing at a time to make sure everything's working by itself um, I've, I have not 
wire these all the way through yet, so I'm going to guide them out. There's a, a hole right here going through the front plate. So I routed the wires to go underneath the motor. Okay, so I added two more short extensions on there, and eventually I will probably end up labeling them. You can maybe uh, even paint one or something to let you know the difference. You c if you hook them up in the wrong spot, it's not going to do any harm. So let's see here. Just make sure that you, you uh, match the negative to negative, you know. Don't plug these in backwards. So on the radio, the dial up here is set to be the shoot spout rotation, or angle. And then this left and right is your blower. Adjust the chute 360 degrees. That's all working. So the last thing to hook up then is the motor wire. Make sure that the motor is off, which is down, and that this is at zero. Blower is off before you plug it in. Again, make sure that this dial is at zero. Snowblower is lifted up in the air right now. So the, the snowblower won't, won't turn on until this switch is up and this switch is down. So if I turn it back off, put it down so you can move the, you know, the lifting. Now if I turn the blower on and then spin the dial just a little bit, there we go. So we have power to it now. And I'll turn it up. Yeah, so it'll take a while to get used to that. Just remember, this is the snowblower, and this is the lifting of the snowblower. And the blower won't turn on if it's lifted up. You know, so keep in mind that, you know, when you lower it, the blower could come on if it's turned on like that. So it's, you know, a little bit of a learning curve, slightly different than the mini Spiker Cat. So then to actually connect the machine, and what we do is we line up the bracket in between these parts here. Just like that. You'll have to lower the, the front until all those holes are lining up. And then I'll just turn it back off. And then we use the really long number 8 sized sheet metal screws with washers just takes, just takes two screws, one on each side, to connect the blower. And that's it, the whole thing is connected now. One last thing to do is, is kind of pull in some of the wires just so they're not hanging too low. I would like to come out with something in the future for wire management up here. I'm not sure what yet, but for now this works. Just kind of tuck them up in there so they're not dragging on the ground. And then we can test the actuator. If we go up, or oh, the machine's off. Okay, so if we go up, Yep, has no problem lifting it, which is sweet. So here now we can adjust the the lower switch for how far it goes down. And you want it to go down and push into the ground, but you don't want it to try and lift the machine up because it's not going to be strong enough to lift the whole front end of the machine up. This thing's like 100 pounds, so you need to set it so it's like just applying force to the ground, but not actually trying to lift the machine off the ground. Oops. Like, that might be just a little bit too hard. But, you know, somewhere around there. If you notice it's riding up the snowbanks too much, 
you can always adjust it and move it. Maybe bring a screwdriver out with you the first run outside. You can always put some tools in the back too behind the other set of batteries. There's enough space for like a crowbar and some wrenches and stuff. So it's kind of crazy just how high this thing can lift the blower up. I think this is actually lifting it up higher than my blue one. And the main reason for that is the aluminum hull. There's no flex happening. On the orange and blue one in all my other videos, the floor panel is plastic. So it actually would like flex up and down. Which is fine because ABS is flexible. It wasn't going to break or anything, but it, you know, it doesn't have as much rigidity as this setup. So it's able to actually lift it higher up in the air which will help a lot for backing up like to get out of a snow pile that like you weren't able to fully blow you know wraps up like the entire project of how to put everything together in the future I am planning on doing all sorts of different top bodies for this I, I will be making a scale cab just like the mini Spiker Cat has and I'll be making a flatbed and also right now in the works I'm making taller bodies of the basher body style and the front one will be kind of more sleek looking than just a big box but I have even larger batteries on the way right now so hopefully we get you know a lot more snow and I will be testing out the other stronger motors for the snowblower that's one of the reasons I needed to get bigger batteries um, so you know stay tuned to my channel for all that stuff and also stay tuned for this because I'm gonna you know make a whole bunch of videos of of this outside so yeah this assembly video became extremely long there was one other thing to do but I think I'll just put it in its own separate video but the the light bar that goes on the machine you know, yeah, I'll, I'll put that in a different video. Also note that there's all sorts of different, different ways that you can buy this from me. You can get the files to print your own. You can buy the hardware from me to, you know, assemble ones that you print. Or you can buy kits from me that you assemble and, you know, have all the printed parts from me. And then you can also get exactly what you're looking at out of the box, like ready to run from me. So let me know in the comments and stuff, you know, what you guys think of everything. Keep me up to date if you guys build one. Like, send me pictures and stuff. I'd love to see if you guys print your own. Like, what colors you use and, you know, things like that. So, thanks for watching.